Well, good evening. Welcome to church tonight. Let's stand together, please. Page 330. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. Page 330. 330. If you from sin are longing to be free, look to the Lamb. Christ on Calvary, look to the Lamb of God, look to the Lamb of God, look to the Lamb of God, for He alone is able to save you, look to the Lamb of God. When Satan tempts and doubts and fears assail, Good to see you here for church. Let's take our prayer bulletins, please. And if you need a prayer bulletin, just lift your hand up. We want to get one to you. And hey, it's an exciting week. We have uh, new lights and then new pews are going to be here next week. So Tuesday, the pews will be arriving and being installed uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. And so uh, I need help. I sent out a text earlier. Uh, let me mention several, several ways. If you can help in any of these ways, it'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, first of all, in the prayer bulletin, uh, we need to, number one, remove all songbooks, envelopes, etc., from the pews. So if you can stick around, what, whatever doesn't get done tonight, it'll still get done. It just makes it easier if a lot of folks are doing it. And so if you're able to stick around for a few minutes, we need to take all the songbooks out of the pews, all the envelopes, prayer request cards, anything on the pews, we want to take those out and then put those things neatly in the back of the auditorium. And then number two, we need to bring all the red padded chairs. We have about 50 of those to the vestibule. They can either go in the vestibule or the back of the auditorium because they will be uh, part of the seating for Sunday. So Sunday we're going to be in chairs in here, and uh, so we need some help carrying those chairs. Again, if uh, several folks can help carry a chair or two, that'll just make it go a lot faster. And then number three, we need to set up the gym for the ladies' fellowship, and that will be 12 round tables, uh, eight chairs, eight folding chairs around all of those tables, and then uh, Miss B uh, will be down there in the gym. She can show you exactly where she wants things, and uh, so if you can help in any and all of those areas, it would be greatly appreciated. And then as far as removing these pews, uh, we'll do that Friday morning. We'll begin Friday morning, I should say, at 8 a.m., and so if you're able to be here at 8, come, come at 8. If you're able to be here at three or four in the evening, whatever you can do, uh, we'll use the help. If you can come for an hour or two, or if you can come all day, uh, it'd be greatly appreciated. What we need to do, we need to move these pews out that door, and many of them will just go right to the back of the auditorium. Brother Gentry is here tonight. Brother Gentry uh, started uh, Victory Baptist Church many years ago, and then now for 20, 
22 years, 23, 22 years, Brother Gentry's been in Africa, and uh, the Lord has used him to start, is it, how many churches is it now in Africa? 925. And so hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people in church every Sunday, I believe. And uh, this, these pews are going to go to a church in Malawi uh, that uh, I think had 2,025 people on April 17th, I think it was. And so I, I told him, I said, now, you know, some of these, the, the legs are falling off. Are you sure you want them? He goes, we want them. He said, They're, they will use them over there. So I'm so glad for that. And uh, by the way, if you haven't gotten to meet Brother Gentry after the service, go by and meet him. He's been serving the Lord for decades, and uh, God's used him in a great way to win a lot of souls to Christ. And so I want to encourage you to meet Brother Gentry. And, uh, but uh, let me get back to the pews. Friday, we'll be hauling these pews out, and uh, Brother Gentry has some trailers lined up to haul them away from here and that he's going to store them for a little while uh, until uh, he's able to get a shipping container. The shipping container is not cheap. To, uh, to, to get the shipping container uh, shipped, it'll be about $15,000. So it's about half what we paid for the pews here. So it's a lot of money, but just pray that uh, God will provide that need and uh, they'll be able to get these shipped. And I know, I know the Lord will in time. So just pray for that, uh, that these pews will make their way over to Malawi and uh, be used over there. All right, also in the prayer bulletin, uh, notice pray for our nation, pray for revival, salvation, pray for our government leaders, servicemen and women. Uh, lift our missionaries to the Lord, uh, the Baxters to South Sudan, Brother Bossy with Jehovah Jireh Ministries, the Guins uh, to uh, Israel, and then their newest prayer letters in the back corner. I encourage you to go by and read that. And then Earl and Yolanda Yates to the Mayans, the Zarises with Christian Radio International, the Swargas to New Zealand, the Duns to China, the Johnsons to Brazil, and Rick and Sarah Damastis to Scotland. So lift our missionaries to the Lord. Don't forget to read their prayer letters and be able to pray for some of the specific requests that they have. Uh, our ministry of the week, the Buildings and Grounds Ministry. Uh, just this week, again, folks were in here working, getting the auditorium ready, getting the building ready. And so I just appreciate everybody jumping in where they can to help in the buildings, to help with the grounds. It's a big task, and I'm thankful uh, for all the folks jumping in wherever you can to be a blessing. Then these needing salvation, pray for these and be a faithful witness. Jacob, Jesse, Terry, Adam, Rita, Glenda, Jerry, Jason, Jessica, Heather, Chase, John, Tyler, and then a new name on this list, Dawn, lift Dawn to the Lord and uh, needing salvation. And then other family and spiritual needs, Judy Pickens, Laura, Kathy's family, Dylan Sisson, Tyler and Kelsey, uh, Emily Boyles, Ryzen Pedigo, Justin Cooper family, Cliff and Judy, Stephanie and Keith, Aaliyah, Jason, and then Nathan Cooper uh, now has a Mrs. Cooper. Yeah, he went to Pakistan and uh, they got married May 16th in Pakistan. He's still over there, and uh, Lord willing, we'll be back June the 10th, so keep Nathan in prayer if you would. And uh, we were able to be a, a little part of the, the ceremony online, watching on Facebook Live, but uh, that was May 16th. So pray for Nathan, though, and it'll take him about a year or so to get his bride over here, and uh, Alan and Sheila know all about that, I know, but uh, just uh, pray for Nathan uh, as he is in Pakistan. By the way, this week they're going... Uh, uh, Meki is her name. That's what we'll call her here. Uh, I think her name's Mahik, but he said we'll call her Meki. So uh, Meki's brother is a pastor, and uh, they bring in 70, 80 kids uh, from Pakistan. They'll feed them, and then they'll give them the gospel. And they've seen many, many saved, kind of like an outdoor Bible club, but it's over in Pakistan, and Nathan's going to be doing that this week. So uh, pray for them as they reach out with the gospel there in Pakistan. Uh, on the back page, notice these health needs, Betty Heath, uh, Jim and Betty Weddle, Brenda Hall, Kenny and Kathy Metcalf, Dave Stearman, Little Blakely, Olivia Cahill, Matthew Heilman, Carl and Ruby Barnes, and then uh, Tim's wife, that's a co-worker of Skyler, uh, and then Carmen, uh, has she had her MRI on her knee yet? She has. Okay, so pray for Carmen as she may be having knee surgery. Uh, then uh, other upcoming surgery, Mary Beth, kidney stone surgery, Brother Johnny having another surgery on his arm. Is there a date on that, Brother Johnny? June the 3rd, okay. So keep Brother Johnny in prayer there. 
uh, recovering, pray for Ellis Snook, Jack Austin, Raju Mabubani, and uh, pray for the salvation of Raju as, as well. Uh, cancer, pray for this small portion of our cancer list, Karen Hess, Earl and Naomi Holsapple, Lois Howell, and Patty Huffman. And then our student of the week, Justin Jones uh, to Bellerman, uh, at Bellerman rather. And then the military member of the week, Brandon Sego. Brandon also is not saved, pray for Brandon. And these ladies expecting, Kelsey Goodman, uh, Jacqueline McGrew, Esther McCune, and Evelyn Bell. Keep these in prayer. And then our shut-ins, Aunt Frances uh, has been in rehab for a while. Is there any update you wanna share? Miss B, go ahead. good <laughs> good okay keep Aunt Francis in prayer uh, Miss Elaine Hamilton Miss Michelle's mom remember her and then our Elmcroft and Green Meadows residents it's been a blessing to be able to be back in Green Meadows and uh, Brother Hyde preached Sunday and just pray for the residents there uh, it was a good group I guess about 25 folks maybe 30 or so with workers and uh, just a good uh, good nursing home ministry and then uh, also pray for uh, Miss Tony's family and the loss of her Aunt Judy and there's some family members there unsaved so pray for wisdom and how uh, Miss Tony can have an impact there and then these prayer requests as well uh, Pete's asking prayer for Annika Gaglio she was here Sunday and uh, Annika is not saved pray for her lift her to the Lord if you would and uh, she still lives near Philadelphia I guess and yeah so pray for Annika uh, Sharon is asking prayer for Kathy Fox her neighbor, she has MRSA and has a lot of pain and is sick to her stomach. So pray for Sharon's neighbor, Kathy. And then pray for Ann Crump for her salvation. And then for her niece, Amy Kinnemoth, who's struggling with cancer. And uh, Miss Sharon met both of those ladies at the Mount Washington Festival out and about soul winning and visiting. So pray for these two. Pray for Ann Crump and then her niece, Amy Kinnemoth. All right, are there any other prayer requests, praises? updates anybody tonight go ahead yes Let's, Hannah go ahead yeah. it's okay oh it's all right no no it's okay hey you, you go ahead right there yeah okay go go ahead Pam go ahead Tell me your dad's name again. Cliff. Cliff, that's right. Grayson? Yeah. Okay. Hannah, go ahead. Good. All right. Mary Beth doing well. Praise the Lord. Who else? Prayer request praises? Miss Cheryl, go ahead. Mm hmm. Hey, was today? today? You're free. All right. Praise the Lord. Good. Uh, basically free. Good. All right. Yes. Miss B, go ahead. Yes, ladies, remember that. That's this Saturday, 4 to 6. And uh, men, we need your help. I know several have said you can now. That's great. Uh, if you can be here a little bit early, that'll be helpful, 3.30. Then we can get some things uh, organized, set up, 
and uh, before uh, the four o'clock ladies fellowship all right any other prayer requests or praises updates anybody all right miss tina go ahead Good. Praise the Lord. An answer to prayer. Amen. Uh, to even be able to have the surgery and then for it to be successful. That's good. All right. Who else? Prayer requests, praises, updates. Go ahead, Miss B. Coming for the ladies' fellowship? Good. Okay. Oh, good. We'll get to be back in folding chairs Sunday. Folding chairs, and you'll have to get here early if you want the padded seats. So, yeah, that's going to be good. Anybody else? Prayer requests, praises, updates? All right. Ushers, if you would come, we'll receive the offering tonight. And let's stand together as we sing. Let's turn together, if you would, to page 464, Nothing Between. Nothing Between, 464. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sin. Let's take our Bibles, please. We'll turn to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. Last week, we began the introduction to 1 John, and uh, this week, we'll cover the entire chapter. I'm excited about this book. Uh, remember, God used John to pen down the gospel of John, and again, really, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ penned down by John. Uh, he penned down 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, 
and the book of Revelation. And this summer, uh, in the evenings, on Sunday nights, we'll be digging into prophecy again, and looking at Revelation, Daniel, Zechariah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, just a lot of places where we find a lot of prophecy in Scripture. And uh, I want to remind you the purpose, why John penned this down. We looked at this last week. In uh, chapter 1, verse 3, he said that he wrote these things that ye... And who is ye? It's a general epistle. It means it went to a whole lot of churches. It went to a whole lot of people. He said that ye uh, also may have fellowship with us. And then in verse 4, he said that he wrote this, that your joy might be full. And I'll remind us again that as a Christian, there's only one way to joy. Uh, happiness is different than joy. Happiness depends upon your happenings. Joy is something that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And the only way to have joy in your heart is to live an obedient life. Jesus said, uh, these things have I written unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And then chapter 2, verse 1, he said he was writing this, that ye sin not. So he's not giving us an excuse to sin. He said, I'm writing to you so you don't sin. And then in chapter 2, also he said that he was writing these things to verify and confirm the truth that they already knew. And then last of all, chapter 2, verse 26, he said he was writing to beware, to make them aware of those false teachers who are trying to seduce them spiritually away from the truth. And I mentioned the group that uh, is, is well known in 1 John, and they're the Gnostics. Gnosis means knowledge. And what the Gnostics taught was that all matter, anything, any, any stuff was bad, and that anything spiritual was good. And the problem with that, there were many false doctrines that came out of that belief system, and we'll see those over and over again. John addresses those in 1 John. The first false doctrine that came from that belief is that Jesus couldn't have literally come in the flesh. Well, if all flesh is just bad by itself, then Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh. And folks, if Jesus didn't come in the flesh, we don't have a Savior. He had to come in the flesh. He had to shed his blood on the cross for us. His body had to be broken for us so we could be saved. The second false doctrine that came from that belief is that within all of us is that goodness or that spirit, that seed of God, and we just have to let it out of ourselves. And folks, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says that God saw the imaginations of man's heart, that it was only evil continually, only evil. Uh, you know, we have such a high view of ourselves, we don't compare ourselves to a holy, holy, holy God. And so the, the false doctrine that came from that belief is that, hey, we're all just basically good creatures. We just have this flesh inhibiting us. We've got to let this, the goodness out. We've got to let the spirit out. And the fact is what we really need is to be born again. And then number three, the third false doctrine that came from that belief was strict asceticism. And again, what that is, it's just severe self-discipline. If you think of those uh, people you've seen who are going down the road in parades and they're whipping their own backs almost as penance for their own sins. Folks, you can whip your back all day and, and won't ever pay for one of your sins. Only Jesus, perfect, sinless blood could pay for our sins. And so uh, then number four, some folks went the complete opposite way and they practiced, and this is an important word because it's a Bible word, and that's licentiousness. And just think of the word license, that it's, it means it gives you a license to sin. And what they were saying was this, well, if our bodies are evil anyway, and they're destined for destruction anyway, just do whatever you feel like doing anyway. So some people went the complete opposite direction and just practiced complete wickedness. And then we saw the key verses last week, chapter 5 and key words, key words appearing in different forms, uh, the word life, the word no appearing over and over and over again, almost a play off of uh, the Gnostics, that word gnosis meaning knowledge. And then the word that appears more times than any other in this whole book is that word love. It appears 46 times in different forms. So let's begin 1 John chapter 1 tonight. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Lord, please speak to our hearts tonight. You know the needs in this room tonight. I pray that you'll use your word, Lord. Go in and out of these pews and Speak to every heart. Give us what we need. Remove every distraction from our hearts and minds. Teach us something, but give us what we need tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice that capital W in verse 1. 
It says the word of life. Well, that, that may look familiar. Go back to the book of John chapter 1. Keep your finger here in 1 John. And look at John chapter 1. And remember verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the, there's the capital W again, word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Who is that, folks? Tell me. That's Jesus Christ. And by the way, this is why it's so important that you have an every word Bible. This is why it's so important that you have a, a, a Bible that every jot and every, tit, every tittle is preserved and it's inspired. One little letter changes the whole meaning of verse 1. And by the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses have inserted one little letter in verse 1. And the one little letter they've inserted is the letter A. And so that verse changes to, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Like, hey, you can become one too if you try hard enough. If you're really righteous, you might be able to be one too. Folks, there's one only begotten Son of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in the beginning. He is the Creator. And notice verse 3. And by the way, here's another falsehood. The Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, God the Father created Jesus Christ, and then Jesus Christ created everything. Well, that's not right. Jesus is the creator. And I want you to notice a key word that says this here, verse 3. It says, all things were made by him. By whom? By Jesus. Notice. And without him, without whom? Without Jesus, was not anything made that was made. Anything created Jesus created it. He is the creator, folks. He wasn't created by God the Father. He is God and very God. He is almighty God. Remember, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor. What's the next part? Somebody tell me. The mighty God. And then look at John chapter 1, verse 14 now. It says, and the word, that's Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Go back now to 1 John chapter 1 and notice what John says again. He said, we have heard him, we've seen him with our eyes, we've looked upon him, our hands have handled him of the word of life. Verse 2, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Understand this, Jesus not only gives eternal life, but Jesus is eternal life. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. And go to 1 John 5, and I'm sure we'll visit this passage over and over and over again as we work our way towards chapter 5. But notice 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. It says, This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Folks, if you have the Son, if you've believed on the Son, you have eternal life. And by the way, those who say, well, you know, those who just believe in God the Father, they're close to salvation. No, they're far from salvation. Because if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. That's what Jesus said. You have to come to the Father through the Son. And if you don't have the Son, you don't have eternal life. And so notice what he said there, that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Life. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 2, John said the life was manifested. We saw it. You know, what does that mean? Here's what it means. This is probably the best way I've heard this said. If, if Jesus could become a book, do you know what book he would be? This book right here. And if this book could be a person, do you know who it would be? Jesus. Because he is the word. And this is the written word. And so this is what it's saying, verse 2. The life was manifested. It wasn't just black and white words on a page. We saw him, John said. We heard him. We handled him. He was, uh, we've looked upon him. He is the word of life, and he is eternal life. Now notice verse 3, what he says. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. He said, I'm, a, I'm a, an eyewitness, that ye also may have fellowship with us. Again, who is the ye? It's a general epistle, so it's to many churches, many believers. He said, I'm writing this to you so you can have fellowship with us. 
Now, we talked about this last week. When we say fellowship, some, last Sunday night, we had a fellowship, right? A group came in and sang. We went. We had hot dogs. No, we didn't have hot dogs. We had burgers and, and uh, chips. And, you know, hey, that was fellowship, right? And we had volleyball. That's fellowship. And basketball, that's fellowship. No, actually, our fellowship is around Jesus Christ. That's what our fellowship is. That's, that's what it, uh, the fellowship is speaking of having a partnership or communion or having something in common, something we share. Look, we're all from many different backgrounds. We all have many different cultures we come from. But what we all share as believers, the fellowship we have is with Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare, un, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. John said, we want you to have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship, John said, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Again, where do we have fellowship? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I mean, that's where believers really connect. You, you may connect with a believer talking sports. I mean, it's kind of fun. I, I do it. I talk sports. You might connect with another believer talking weather. You know, you might, how, how's the weather where you're from? Well, same as where you're from, you know. Um, you might connect with a believer about some activity, but I'm going to tell you where you'll have the deepest connection to a believer. And that is when you have fellowship around God's word and when you have fellowship around the Lord Jesus Christ. When you share those things, there is no greater fellowship. And notice what John writes down in verse 4. He said, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Again, if you want fullness of joy, the key is obedience. If you're missing, if you're missing joy in your life, you're missing obedience. Uh, obedience, the Bible says gladness is sown for the upright in heart. If you find your joy is lacking, it could be there's an area of disobedience that you've ignored that you have not dealt with God about. Now notice verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. I didn't bring my sunglasses tonight, but I love that verse. Notice what it says. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There's not even a hint of darkness in God. He's of purer eyes than to behold evil. He is not like us. He, he is not, uh, uh, doesn't have a sinful bend like we do. He has no darkness in him at all. So when people try to make God in their image and say, hey, I drink a beer with Jesus, you have no clue who he is. Because he had, there's no darkness in him at all. Well, I feel this way about this, so God must too. You know what you're doing? You're making a God in your own image. What you really need to do is say, what is the, who is the God of the Bible? Well, I'll tell you who the God of the Bible is. In him is no darkness at all. He won't tolerate sin at all. Uh, James 2.10 for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in how many points? In one point. That, doesn't that seem kind of stringent? Doesn't that seem kind of strict? Well, God says, you know, hey, if I live my whole life and, you know, never sinned except for one time, God said, you do that one time, you've broken the whole law. See, what he's getting at here in 1 John 1 is you need to have a clear vision of who God really is. He is pure, he is holy, he is light, and in him is no darkness at all that's very important to understand as we move forward in this chapter now notice verse 6 and all throughout 1 John you're going to find statements like this it'll say something like if we say or uh, if we do this or if we do that uh, or it'll say he that saith and here's what he's saying when he says these comments what he's saying is you can claim something that really isn't true. So right here he's going to say, if we say, you say you have fellowship, but you're doing this, then you really don't have fellowship. So he's going to say that over and over and over again throughout the book of 1 John in different ways. It's kind of like me if I said, uh, I'm on a diet. If we say we're on a diet, but eat a 12-pack of chocolate donuts for breakfast and have an extra tall syrupy latte mid-morning, some of you are going, what's a latte? Good, God bless you. You, know, you drink black coffee, don't you? And you have a quarter pounder supersized meal for lunch with an extra large Diet Coke and a pizza buffet for dinner and at 11 p.m. and a 2 a.m. snack. You may say you're on a diet, but you're not. 
Or you might be on a seafood diet. You see food and you eat it. You know, that's, that's the kind of diet you might be on. You know, here's the thing. You're either lying to us if you say you're on a diet or you're lying to yourself. You, you might sincerely believe you're on a diet, but the evidence points to the fact that you're not, right? You say, Pastor, did you eat a 12-pack of donuts? No, thankfully I didn't, but I was tempted. Um, the, the point is this. There are many things that people say, they claim, but then there's no proof to back up the claim. And that's what we're going to find throughout 1 John. And the first claim here in verse 6 is this. If we say that we have fellowship with him. Remember, he wrote this so that the people hearing could have fellowship with John. And John said, truly, our fellowship is with God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. In verse 6, he said, if we say that we have fellowship with him. And again, what is fellowship? It's communion. It's having things in common. It's sharing a common purpose. He said, if we claim we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if we claim on one hand, hey, I'm close to God, I have fellowship with God, but then we're walking in darkness. Now, don't miss this. Don't miss this part. How much darkness do you need to be walking in to not be in fellowship with God? Well, let me remind you of something. God is light, and in him is what? No darkness at all. So, so well, this must be talking to the really bad sinners, this is talking to the people who are really, really far away from God. How much sin does God tolerate? How much sin does God tolerate? None. None. So what in the world, Pastor? See, I'm getting there. The point is this. He's saying if we claim, hey, I have fellowship with God, but I'm ignoring this sin. Well, my sin isn't as bad as so-and-so's. Yeah, but it's sin. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, how much darkness? Any darkness. We lie and do not the truth. Why? Because in him is no darkness at all. And any time you're walking in any darkness, you're not in fellowship with God. Because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Say, so, well, that leaves us all in bad shape. It sure does. You see, what it does is it shows us who we really are without Christ. Notice verse 7. He says, but if we walk in the light. Now, hold on. What does that mean? Don't, don't confuse that to say that means we are without sin. Because that is not what he's saying. Because in the very same verse, he's going to talk about his sin. He says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, don't, don't read through this quickly. Look what it says. If we walk in the light, what's the next phrase? As he is in the light. How much is he in the light? All the way. He is the light. 100%. So how in the world am I ever going to have fellowship with God? Good question. How am I ever going to have fellowship with a holy God? Good question. There's only one way. Through Jesus Christ. See, Paul, the, that's Paul. John's point here, I've been preaching 2 Corinthians too many Wednesdays. John's point here is this. If you really think you've risen to the level where you're, you and God are just like this, you really don't understand how holy God is. Notice what he says. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, are you at that level? Then notice what he says. We have fellowship. Now, there, this is a very important word. He doesn't say we are family. Don't miss this. He doesn't say if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we are family. Guess what? If you've believed on Jesus Christ, you are family. You are born again into the family of God. You're born again. You're adopted. And, and will God ever throw you back? You know, is it blasted assurance, Jesus was mine? Is it every other day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before? I mean, what kind of father would God be if you're born into his family and you're adopted into his family? And then he goes, no, you're out of my family. What kind of comforter would the Holy Spirit be if he moves in and then he decides, I'm moving out? And what kind of savior would Jesus be if he saves you, but now he throws you back and now you're lost again? You see, the point is this, that the only way we can have fellowship, the only way, 
We can have fellowship with a holy God who is light and in him is no darkness at all is through the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. Now look, we, we get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But even as a child of God, you can strain your fellowship with God. Once you're saved, you are always saved. Say, Pastor, you believe once saved, always saved? That's what the Bible teaches. Otherwise, it's not salvation. God gives us eternal life. He gives us everlasting life. And when you believe on Christ, your sins are washed away. You are placed in Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's very important as well. When we get later in this book, there's false doctrine that people preach from this book saying, if, if you really get saved, you never sin again. Well, that's going to get shot out of the water right here in chapter 1. But notice he says that uh, we're born again, we, we have, uh, we're born into the family of God, but then our fellowship can be strained. I, I, have, I have good children, I know they get tired of me giving personal illustrations sometimes, and they are really are good kids. Yes, they're normal, but they're, they're good kids. They love the Lord, they want to serve the Lord. But imagine if I went to one of my children, and let's just, let's just pick one, I said, you know, go, go clean your room. Say, which one? I'm not going to tell you. Go clean your room. And, and they would never do this. But let's just pretend for a minute. Maybe they've thought of doing this, but they've never done it. No! Boom! Slam the door. I'm not doing it. Oh, that's okay. No, I wouldn't do that. Believe me. <laughs> um, let me ask you a question. Are they still my children? Did that change? Did that change? Is that sin what they did? Absolutely, it's sin. Am I going to correct them? You better believe it. <laughs> I'm going to straighten them out. Why? Because I see better things for them than that. I'm going to straighten them out. And guess what? They're still, though, part of my family. But guess what is strained? Our fellowship. Right after they do that, and they, they just go in the room, slam the door, come out later. Hey, Dad, you mind? Can we, can we go you know, play up at the park and get an ice cream cone? No. <laughs> we have something to deal with first. What's strain? The fellowship. You see, as a child of God, again, he's, he's not telling us this so we will sin. In fact, chapter 2 begins with that. I'm writing these things to you so you won't sin. But listen, when you do sin as a child of God, I said when. I didn't say if. Remember, David said this. He, he said, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. You know what that is? That's sinning on purpose. But then there's sins of ignorance, sins you don't even know are sin. But let, let's just pretend for a minute. Just let me ask this question. You don't have to raise your hand. But have you ever sinned on purpose since you were saved? You knew it was wrong and you sinned. I'm going to tell you I already know the answer. Because I know the answer for me and I know what God's word says. The fact is this, when we sin against God, sins of commission or sins of omission, as his children, our fellowship is strained. We are not taken out of the family of God. God chastens his children, but our fellowship is strained. So I want you to notice, go back to the beginning of verse 7. He says, if we walk in the light. Well, what light is he talking about? Psalm 119, 130 says, the entrance of thy words giveth light. When I see myself compared to a holy God, you know what? I don't look so holy anymore. When I see myself compared to God's holy word, when I walk in the light, I don't look so holy anymore. If we walk in the light, the truth of God's word, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth. And that word cleanseth means continual cleansing. Cleanseth us from how much sin? All sin. I want you to look at a couple examples of what this is saying. Go to uh, John chapter 9, verse 26. John chapter 9, verse 26. There's nothing new here, folks. There really isn't. There's nothing new. It's just another way to say the same things we've known before. Notice John 9, 26. When you walk in the light of the word of God, you compare yourself to a holy God and to God's holy word. What do you realize? You realize how sinful you are. And it, by the way, if you feel like you're not that sinful, if you feel like you're really super close to God, it's very possible you're really not as close as you think you are. You know, as Paul, and I'd say we'd all agree, as men go, Paul was a pretty decent man. Yeah, he was a sinner, but as men go. And what did he say? I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth 
no good thing. He said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I want you to notice John 9, look at verse 26. There, this is the story of the man who was born blind from his birth. Jesus heals him. They came to him. They said, hey, they give God the praise. We know Jesus is a sinner. And notice what the man, um, man says, verse 25, actually. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he had already told them. Verse 27, he answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Oh, that got them riled up. Verse 28, then they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. And no, actually they weren't. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Now notice verse 29. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, Jesus, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said to them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. You see that pride? How it's damning their souls. It's blocking their vision. Remember, remember the simple definition of light? It's that which helps you to see clearly. Notice verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. When he found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord? Notice, he's already believing, I believe on him. That I might believe on him. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talked with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, don't miss this, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. What in the world is he talking about? We'll keep reading, verse 40. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore your sin remaineth. What, what is he saying? In their own eyes, they see clearly. In their own eyes, in their own opinion of themselves, they're really good. You know the problem? They're not walking in the light as he is in the light. Because if they're walking in the light of God's word, if they're walking in the light of God's truth, if they're walking in the light of Jesus Christ himself, they would realize what a lost sinner they are. Uh, go over to Matthew chapter 9. Notice this one, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew, otherwise known as Levi, also in the Bible, he was a tax collector, a publican. And no, that's not a party, a political party. He's a publican. He is a, a Jew working for the Roman government. He charges more than he should. He pockets the excess. He's a crook. But Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. Notice Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. It says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. The publicans were despised. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? You know the problem with the Pharisees? They couldn't see how sinful they were. They were blind to their own sinfulness. They were not walking in the light. The light that was in them was darkness. They were comparing themselves to a publican and thinking they were righteous and holy before God. And they said, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole, those who are healthy, need not a physician but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Notice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Is Jesus saying there are actually righteous people who don't need repentance? Is that what he's saying? No, what he's saying is they think they're righteous. They think they are. But if they'd walk in the light, if they'd really come to the light, as John 3 says you're to do, they would see 
their lost condition. They'd see they'd need a Savior. Go back to 1 John 1, 7 again. Notice what he says. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. The only way I can have fellowship, the only way I can be part of the family of a holy God is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, washing away my sins. That's it. Now notice verse 8. If we say, again, here's a claim that's not true. If we say that we have no sin, well, why would you say that? Because you're not walking in the light. You're not letting the light truly shine into your heart. If we say that we have no sin, who are we lying to? Notice, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now notice verse 9. If we confess our sins, what is a believer to do to restore fellowship with his heavenly Father? Right here, verse 9. If we confess our sins, what does confess mean? Let's go back to that analogy. My children slam the door, and they, and they haven't done that. They're good kids, thank God. Let's say they did that. And then they came back out of the room and said, Yeah, Dad, I slammed the door in your face. Is that, is that confess what God's asking for here? No. The word confess, it means to agree with God. That's what it means. to. If they came out and said, You know what? I, I was so wrong. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Say, would that be the end of it? It'd be close to the end of it. It'd be close. When God, when God shows you any sin in your life, any darkness, say, well, yeah, but I'm not as bad. No, no, no. Let the light shine into your heart. When he shows you any sin in your heart, what should you do? Well, let me remind you, God won't fellowship. He's not, in him is no darkness at all. What does he want you to do? He wants you to confess your sin. By the way, not to a preacher, not to a priest. What does he want you to do? He wants you to agree with him about your sin. He wants you to go, God, you hate that sin, so do I. Lord, you hate the way I talk to that person, so do I. Please forgive me if we confess our sins. You want an example of what it means to confess your sins? Go to Psalm 51. We don't have time to read it. It's a penitential psalm. It's David getting thoroughly right with God after Bathsheba. What is he doing? His heart is broken. He has a contrite spirit, literally a crushed spirit before God, and he's confessing his sin. He's agreeing with God about his sin. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, notice, he is faithful. What does that mean? It means every time. Every time he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. How is it just? How is it right? How is it justice for God to just forgive us? I'll tell you how it's justice. Because somebody already paid the price, Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, not only are we deceiving ourselves, but notice, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I want to read just the first part of verse 1, because this is where we'll pick up next week. Make no mistake, he's not writing this to say, Here, here's a quick get right with God card. Just go ahead and sin all you want. Here's the truth. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit of God is in you, and when you sin, the Holy Spirit will grieve you, because you're grieving him, because he sees more important things for you. So... Make no mistake about it. What does he say? Verse 1, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Boy, I want to preach that tonight, but that's next Wednesday. Romans 6 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Here's what he wants you to do. He wants you to be real. He wants you to be in the light, to walk in the light, to be honest to stop pretending to be more than a sinner saved by grace who's been transformed into a child of God. You say, but my, my sin's not that bad. What did David pray? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Not just my actions, my thoughts. 
and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Would you let the Holy Spirit of God shine his light deep into your heart? Would you walk in the light as he is in the light? How much darkness is in him? No darkness at all. No darkness at all. The Holy Spirit shines something in your heart. Would you yield? Would you confess? What does that mean? It means agree with God about it. Quit excusing it. Quit sweeping it under the rug. Quit shoving it into a corner of your heart. Confess. Forsake. What does the Bible say? He'll be faithful. Every time he'll forgive. And it's just. How is it just? Because Jesus paid the price. That's not fair. No, it isn't fair. He had to suffer the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He had to suffer the sinless one for sinners. But it is love. That's what it is. Lord, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts. Lord, I pray that we will allow the light of your word to shine deep in our hearts, to show us things that need to be dealt with. Lord, that we will confess those things, that we'll forsake those things. And we know your promise. You said you're faithful, you're just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for that promise. Thank you for your word. Bless now as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to sing together right after we sing. If you are able to stay for 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever you can do to help, that would be greatly appreciated. God bless you. All right, let's stand together if you can, please. Page 357. 357. We'll sing all three of the verses, and then we'll do that chorus at the so we'll sing all three of those together. One, two, and three. 357. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, I have. I have an anchor, I'm very sure, I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. missed.